the jet to reduce the thermal signature, the infrared signature of the jet plume. Here's the exhaust plume from a jet engine, an enticing target for any heat-seeking missile. But just by changing the exhaust nozzle shape, the size of the heat plume is cut. At first glance, it may not seem like much, but this 40% reduction in the plume could be enough to save the aircraft from a heat-seeking missile strike. The chink in the jet engine's armor may be about to disappear. Early fighter jet designs did not differ much in appearance from their propeller-driven predecessors. But the shape of today's fighter jet bears little resemblance to those of the 1940s. As aircraft speed soared, the airframe began to feel the strain. Pilots were experiencing an alarming new phenomenon. In the later stages of the war, Mustangs and Thunderbolts were diving down on the Germans as they were climbing up to attack and not engaging the Germans, but just vanishing into oblivion. In the immediate post-war years, more and more jet fighters were running into trouble. You start to get shaking on the controls and one wing would tend to drop. Accident rates were rising, pilots were being killed. The fighter jet was running into a brick wall. It had to be done. As World War II was ending, the fighter jet age was well underway. Aircraft speeds in excess of 600 miles per hour were now becoming possible. But pilots were coming up against an invisible barrier. What ultimately became known as the sound barrier started to be recognized during the Second World War. Fighter pilots started to report curious control responses when they were diving um, at high speeds. And these effects became collectively known as compressibility. Here's a scale model of the nose of a jet aircraft. By putting it into a wind tunnel, it's possible to see the effects of compressibility. In just seconds, this tunnel can generate wind at supersonic speed. As the aircraft nose meets the sound barrier, the individual lines of shock waves are plain to see in this reflected image. When you're getting near the speed of sound, you get a build-up and drag ahead of the aircraft. The aircraft sends out pressure waves ahead of it, and as you get near the speed of sound, the air ahead hasn't got time to open up and let the aircraft through it, and it runs into virtually a brick wall. It was these shock waves that were causing pilots to lose control. This discovery would change the way fighter jets were built forever. The Meteor had a straight wing. Straight wings are good and efficient at low speeds. Um, but when we start flying close to the speed of sound, we find that the typical aerofoil section is too short and fat. This thickness relative to this length isn't good for high-speed flight. Aircraft designers in Britain and America worked to solve this problem, but they were soon to discover that a solution had already been found. It was only really discovered during the very latter stages of the war when the uh, German research facilities were being overrun by the Allies, just how far ahead in terms of aerodynamics, wing shape, the Germans were. The innovation was simple but brilliant. Sweep the wings back. So this is our same, the same wing. If it were flying as a straight wing, air is passing this way. If we'd sweep it so that the air is now passing in this direction, as far as the air is concerned, it now sees a quite different shape. It sees a much more slender aerofoil shape. This technique dramatically reduced the impact of shock waves. A solution so effective that it's now used on every jet fighter. Uh, there is no wing shape that uh, is currently flying and has flown that the Germans hadn't done research on back here in the 1940s. It was the swept wing that enabled fighters not just to pass the speed of sound, but to go to Mach 2 and beyond. High performance demands low weight. 
but as fighter jets have evolved, they've had to carry an ever-increasing array of weapons. It's always been extremely important for structural engineers to reduce the weight when it comes to aeroplanes because the heavier the aeroplane, the more thrust you are going to require to push it through the air. So the challenge was to reduce the weight of the airframe. In the 1950s, steel began to disappear in favor of lighter metals such as aluminium. But a revolutionary material was about to change everything, not a metal, an organic fabric. Carbon fiber, this new wonder material, is what's used on virtually all of the modern range of fighters. So, what's so special about carbon fiber? It's a very lightweight fabric, but yet, when it's put together, it's very, very stiff. The secret lies in the way each panel is made out of layers or plies. We put the plies in different directions because that's what actually gives you the strength. By laying each carbon fibre ply at a different angle, an incredible degree of structural strength is produced. But it's not just the material that's revolutionary. Here at BAE Systems, lasers pinpoint the position of each ply. The laser's actually telling us where to lay the ply. It's very much like dressmaking, laying a pattern on a piece of material. The finished panels give Typhoon a dramatic reduction in weight without any loss in strength. The wing from top to bottom is carbon fibre. The fin is carbon fibre. So we've got high strength, high stiffness, very low weight. And a perfect fit. Automated machining now means that Typhoon is the most precisely constructed aircraft in the world. So 21st century construction materials and techniques are close to producing the ultimate airframe. But design can't stand still. Constant change is demanded to give the fighter jet its edge. The cockpit is the most complex part of the aircraft. From here, everything else is controlled. In the first fighter jets, the cockpit was a very basic design. This is a conventional type cockpit, very similar to its aircraft prior to the Meteor. It's got a control column, obviously, that, that controls elevators and ailerons, moves in the same directions as, as Spitfires and Hurricanes. On the left-hand side of the cockpit are the throttles, both together. You normally operate them both together, forward for open, back for closed, and below that, the air brake lever. World War II flying aces were at home with these controls, but as jet fighter cockpits became more complex, pure flying skills were no longer enough. Eventually, with the pilot being expected to operate things like radar, other weapon control systems, um, air to air missiles, then other dials, other systems start to encroach into the cockpit. By 1960, with the introduction of aircraft like the Lightning, the tasks of the pilot were mushrooming. It was very, as we tend to say, mandrolic. It required a lot of manual input, a significant degree of seat of the pants type flying, and it was very, very high workload. The workload was so high that a lot of people failed the course. They could fly the aircraft, but they just couldn't get their minds through operating all these other complicated bits and pieces. Pilots were reaching the extreme limits of their capabilities. Then, in 1979, a critical breakthrough. The American F-16 Fighting Falcon came into service, and with it, an onboard computer to assist the pilot. The computers know what configuration the aeroplane is in, what missiles have been fired, how much fuel it's got, where its center of gravity is. The potential of the computer knew no limits. Now, fighter aircraft were able to perform maneuvers way beyond the capabilities of human beings. Modern combat aircraft are designed to be naturally unstable. That becomes too much for the pilot to handle on his own. So the, the, operating the aircraft is then taken away and given to a, a computer system. So the, the pilot doesn't directly control the aircraft. He tells the computer what he wants the aircraft to do. The latest fighter jets have four computers to operate all their systems. Typhoon has quadruplex, so-called, fly-by-wire, so in essence, um, I can't fly it. And in fact, uh, if the computers were to fail, I would lose control of it almost instantaneously. Typhoon's cockpit is a million miles away from the Spitfire. Knobs and dials have long gone. 
Instead, screens and a head-up display give the pilot only the information he needs to know at that particular